Welcome, professors, students, and distinguished guests, to, to this milestone workshop commemorating the 50th anniversary of A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, has left a mark on modern Gaudiya Vaishnavism in Hinduism and beyond. Today's workshop aims for more than just an in-depth exploration of Bhaktivedanta Swami's teachings. We are expanding also the conversation to consider larger themes like globalization and the various ways modernity is experienced across the globe. By including perspectives from historical predecessors in Swami Bhaktivedanta Prabhupada's religious lineage, we seek to enrich our understanding of how his teachings intersect with broader historical, philosophical, cultural, social, and political landscapes. At the heart of Bhaktivedanta Swami's work is a personalistic and monotheistic understanding of God crystallized in the practice of bhakti, or devotion to Krishna. This manifests through a spectrum of traditional rituals, spiritual activities, and even volunteer services, all framed within a thoughtful philosophical context. So, uh, you're welcome to this uh, workshop that starts with that right now, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. I give the word to Mons Bro, who is uh, a lecturer from Obo uh, Academy in Finland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sardella. It is my great uh, pleasure and honor to be chairman of this first session and to introduce to you Professor Shantan Day. He is an associate professor of, in the Department of History uh, at Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandira, Birugumat, in Kolkata. And he's going to speak to us about Bhakti Vinod and Bhakti Vinanta Swami historicizing a shared legacy. And you have 20 minutes, I'll show you them when time is nearing its end. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mon, sir. And uh, I'm really, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I would like to personally thank Ferdinando for giving me the opportunity to be here today. And uh, as you can see, the title of the presentation is A Shared Legacy. Uh, the reason being that I wanted to specify certain things about Bhaktivinod Thakur, who came uh, uh, almost a hundred years back uh, before uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami's time. And since we are standing here on this day, which is uh, the 6th of September, exactly 50 years back on this very day, Bhaktivedanta Swami had come over here and spoken at this very auditorium. So it gives a special relevance to this uh, significance to this day. Uh, and this also allows us to uh, reassess and look at the tradition as it has developed over the course of the last two centuries or so. So the ISKCON, as we all know, is a movement which was begun in around the 1960s, mid-1960s. But the Gaudiya Vaishnava movement, as we know it, is a far longer tradition and obviously the ISKCON has been tapping into it and it's an integral part of that movement. So uh, I would like to uh, go into the time of the 19th century and look at the colonial period in Bengal as uh, was there in around uh, 150 years back. So if we are to understand this phenomenal rise and spread of ISKCON, I think it is very important for us to also look at the antecedents, the, uh, the processes that went ahead and went into the making of this movement that we know globally as ISKCON. So as Prabhupada once said, I don't claim uh, that I am a pure devotee or perfect, but my only qualification is that I am trying to follow the instruction of the perfect. So as we can imagine, he was also trying to imbibe and also trying to integrate a greater tradition that he had been following and which he tried to bring about in the world as we know. 
So these are the three pictures, as we are aware, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, who was a 19th century uh, theologian as well as a scholar of sorts uh, in the 19th century and into the early 20th century, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and Prabhupada, uh, they all fit together into a paradigm and a logical continuum. And this logical continuum actually tries to show how the ideas and the traditions that we find it today have been shaped up by the past. What was Bhaktivinoda's legacy in the eyes of Prabhupada? If we look at how Prabhupada looked at uh, Bhakti uh, Vinod's Thakur, then we will be able to assess how he looked at his own tradition. Prabhupada always stressed the fact that he was only a messenger, and he stressed this point. And he also stated that the mercy is of Bhakti Vinod Thakur and uh, Prabhupada, that is Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. So these two figures played a very significant role in shaping his ideas. The Krishna conscious movement is also looked at by him as a fulfillment of the prophecy that had been made by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And these are uh, available and uh, there are comments uh, in, 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 in his uh, works whereby he states that he is merely following the footsteps of his predecessors. He also stresses the point that he is following Bhakti Vinod Thakur, who is an Acharya of the movement. That is, he looks at him as a leader. So why did Prabhupada attach so much importance to Bhakti Vinod Thakur? This is something which is very significant to remember. And why I state this is that the colonial legacy, which was there in the 19th century, which actually shaped the tradition as it was to happen in the uh, colonial period and later on, this was shaped by the traditions which were happening in India. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur played a very significant role in creating an awareness among the middle classes of Bengal at that time. And this was the germination of that movement, which was later taken abroad by Bhakti Vedanta Swami. So if we, if we look at the uh, points that have been mentioned over here, we find that there are several segments of populations in colonial India which were giving out a very negative, stereotyped image of Vaishnavas and Vaishnavism. This was almost like the norm in the 19th century. So Vaishnavas were looked down upon by a variety of segments of population. Uh, the colonial masters also looked at them in a similar fashion. The Christian missionaries who came to India uh, in the 19th century also tried to malign the character of the various divinities that were available at that time uh, in India. So this is something which needs to be kept in mind when we speak of a restructuring, a revitalization of the tradition <laughs> during this period. So the objectification, as is being stated, is an objectification of the traditions, the practices, and the theology of the Vaishnavas in a very stereotyped manner. And this stereotyping had a negative impact on the Vaishnavas of the colonial period. The colonial ethnographic data, the census, this also had a very negative impact on the colonial traditions. Why I mention this is that there were figures which were sometimes manipulated to show that the number of females within the uh, population of the Vaishnavas were larger than that of the males. The significance being that they were inculcating and they were trying to integrate various kinds of segments of population who were loose in morals. I also bring up another um, facet, uh, which is the visual imagery that we have from the 19th century. These are Kalighat pots, the Potachitra, the paintings that we have from the 19th century, which try to show there's just one picture which I would like to specify, the one on the right, where you find that a Babaji or a Goswami being beaten with a broomstick by a lady. So this is actually typifying the discourses that were available in the 19th century. And these are paintings from the 19th century itself. So you can understand and imagine what kind of uh, discourse was going on in India in this period. And this was a challenge that Bhaktivinoda Thakur had to face uh, from 
the colonial state as well as its policies. So what was the condition of the Vaishnava world in this time when uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur was trying to uh, reimagine his traditions? In fact, we find that the loose structures, the loose uh, clusters of Vamsas, various hereditary sects, and various other cults which had been shaping up in the 18th century and the 19th century, they had given a bad name to Vaishnavism because the original inspiration which was there in the 16th century, the inspiration of uh, Chaitanya and his followers, that had become dissipated by the time of the 18th and the 19th century. And this was the reason why we find that there was the need to restructure and to reimagine the tradition in a rational, modernized manner. And this is what is done by Kedarnath Dattva, Vakpivinov Thakur. Uh, if we try to contextualize the 19th century, colonialism was, uh, to a certain extent, uh, impinging on the Indian traditions, but it was also trying to give out a message whereby we find that the printing presses which were coming into shape was permitting a new resurgence of literature, new types of literature, a uh, reimagining of uh, the original manuscripts. They were being printed and a public opinion, a public discourse based on a Vaishnava worldview was trying to get shaped up during this period. So we find a number of layers within it and one of the layers which is very important over here is the rise of Bengali Vaishnava journals. And we find that Bhaktivinoda Thakur was just one. There were several others who were also trying to make a change in this format. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was a pioneer in the Bhakti movement of Bengal and these images which just show to us his life in different facets from different segments of his lifespan show that he turned into a theologian and a, an expert in religious studies at the end of his life from around the 1860s. There was a transformation that came about and he tried to inculcate the Vaishnava worldview and popularize and disseminate it in the world at large. But originally he was also a district magistrate and a district collector which is a colonial administrative post and he held it and he's traveled various places in Bengal of the 19th century. If we look at his life, then we would also uh, find the importance of a particular text that he wrote, which is the Swali Gita Jivani, the autobiography that he had written in around 1896. And this is the original letter which he had written to his son and it was later on published uh, by various people, including the latest in 2023. And these are also uh, pictures from the place where he was born in present-day Nadia. Birnagar is the place where he was born. And uh, this Swalikita Jeevani showcases the transformation of a person's life. Bhaktivinoda Thakur's transformation is looked at from this format. If we move on to the contribution that Bhaktivinoda Thakur had, Kedarnath Dattar had on the, uh, on the Vaishnava world, then we must also understand the way in which he tried to fix normative standards, the norms and the behavioral patterns that a society required, a Vaishnava society required. And this was extremely important. I find it significant that he emphasized on various attitudes, various inspirational facets, which he considered to be the identifier of a Vaishnava. And among these, he mentions about daya or sympathy. He mentions about sinlessness. He mentions about innocence and also truthfulness, equanimity, humility, peacefulness, a reserved behavior on one's part and friendship. He emphasized on these points in order to cultivate a type of behavior among the Vaishnavas which would counter 
the opinions which were there in the colonial discourses. As we have just mentioned, the, the way in which the colonialists tried to portray Vaishnavas in a very negative light, that stereotyping was now tried to be reversed by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And he was one of those who tried to initiate it at the first level. There were others also who tried to do it, but he was one of the pioneers in doing that. If you look at the Sajjantoshani, is the name of the journal that he had created in around the 1880s, and this was one of the most significant Vaishnava journals with a large subscription base, and this particular document, actually it traveled and it was subscribed to by people all across Bengalis, living not just in Bengal at that time, but also in Brindavan and other places, used to subscribe to this. And there was a public opinion which was emerging as a result of this kind of discourse, the reversal of the stereotyped images which were being circulated. This was happening as a result of this. So we find that Bhaktivinoda Thakur's main inspiration, the way in which he tried to recreate tradition was through a modernist understanding of tradition. He tried to look at how the middle classes, the understanding sections of the society, the educated sections of the society, the literate ones, how they could be imbibed and they could be encouraged to become Vaishnava. So this was one of the essential layers of his understanding. And he stressed on the point that there are three layers, the Komala Shraddhas, the Madhyama Adhikaris, and the Uttama Adhikaris. So one had to progress gradually from one's understanding from the base down and upwards still becoming a Sadagrahi or a Uttama Adhikari. So one had to increase one's conscious level, consciousness level and one's attitude towards Krishna through his approach. So print, readership and the creation of a public sphere, these three points gel together very well in the works of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And he tried to write, these are just four glimpses of the various works that he had done, but the Sajjan Toshini journal, which is on the right, is perhaps the most significant because it had been printed and it had travelled to various places. So, the, he also was a pioneer in bringing about a cultural transformation, a preaching program, a mass contact program of sorts through the Namahatta movement, whereby the importance of preaching, the importance of taking the name was cultivated. And there were preachers who were sent to different parts of Bengal and they tried to create this particular uh, movement at the uh, base of society. Not just that, he was also trying to build up an organizational structure by the, by the, by, by the name of the Vishwa Vaishnava Raj Sabha. And this was important because he considered that the message of the Bhagavad was not just limited to just Hindus, not just to the Indians, but to the world at large. And that is the message that he tried to give out. And why I stress this point is that he was bringing about a message which found resonance later on during the time of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and also later on under the inspiration of his call. This particular slide is obviously looking at his importance in the recreation and the identification of Mayapur as the site of relevance. The, as we all know, Chaitanya was born in around 1486 in a place called Mayapur in Nadia. And this is actually researched. It comes about during the time of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was the person who created a particular uh, sabha, uh, a committee, and this in 1894 tried to bring about this change. As we all know, the ISKCON has its headquarters in, uh, in Mayapur today, and this is where we find the new temple of Vedic Planetarium, which is coming up, will be built at that place. But this is actually a resurgence of the locations of Chaitanya's travels, Chaitanya's uh, 
uh, he visited various places and these were mapped geographically as well as its importance and significance was circulated among society during this period. So this is the Yoga Pita temple and this is the temple of Vedic Planetarium which is coming up in Mayapur uh, which would be built by hopefully next year. So in conclusion what I wish to state is that the resonance of most of the approaches which were taken by uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami in the 1960s, 70s, till his death in around 1977 were parts of those processes which were in operation right from the time of the 19th century. And he magnified it, he molded it so that it could reach even further distances and this is the significance that Bhaktivedanta Thakur had. So, Thank you so much for your patient listening and I would be welcome to answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Day. Now we have a discussant, Professor Knut Jakobsen from the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Bergen. You're welcome. Thank you for this uh, excellent and uh, very rich paper. It gives some of the larger uh, religious and social context of uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's contribution to Vaishnavism. It illustrates also the, the great change uh, that, uh, that came about with the print culture in Bengal and uh, new expectations. And I was particularly interested in, in that. Um, I mean, the view that there was a, a quote, neg negligence of Hindu scripture uh, among the educated Bengali classes of the 19th century means, I think, that there arose new expectations about the role of texts in religious life. Before the printing press in Bengal, religious texts had been available for the most of Few, very few people, because there were only handwritten manuscripts. Yeah. With printing technology, a new religious culture was created with easy access to texts for those who could read and write. And there also arose the expectations that people should be readers of these texts. Um, and uh, this easy access, as you have explained, caused uh, rediscoveries of religious heritage and show the difference between normative texts and liberalism. Uh, and it promoted, I think, not only among Marshallists, but in, uh, among men in Bengal, um, new orthodoxies uh, and uh, revivals. Book printing created an enormously productive literary culture expressed in many genres, uh, not least in new religious and philosophical texts. Uh, now, to counter the negligence of Hindu scripture became an important drive, I think also of the following gurus, uh, uh, Siddhanta and Prabhupada, and we learned, um, uh, and the movement as a whole, and uh, do you see a continuation here? Yes, definitely. As I stated, it has to be looked at as a continuation. And uh, obviously, uh, in fact, the emphasis, not just on trying to uh, assess, but also trying to look at the scriptures in a new way, and how to assimilate the knowledge which is there in the scriptures, and assimilate that among the people at large. So this was the role, the critical role that was played by Bhakti Vedanta Swami, as well as prior to him, by Siddhanta Saraswati as well as Bhakti Vinod Chakur. So here you have a continuity, but not just the soft traditions, also the hard institutions which came up. So the organizational base of the uh, movement as such was now rebuilt by all three people. As we all know, the Gaudiya Mutt was built up by Siddhanta Saraswati. Uh, prior to him, Bhakti Vinod Chakur had built up this particular institution, which is known as the Vishwa Vaishnava Raj Sabha, and later on, uh, Bhakti uh, Vedanta Swami did the same. 
with the institutional basis of the movement. So, not just institutionally, content-wise and methodologically as well, you have a continuity. So, continuity is the theme, mm -hmm. basically. Yes, thank you. Because one of the characteristics of, uh, of uh, Prabhupada and ISKCON is the enormous uh, network of distribution of books. So, I mean, that became really a trademark. Of, and uh, you illustrate very well that this goes back uh, to the early period. Now, the, my other question is um, that one characteristic feature of this uh, parampara, I would say, with Bhakti Vinod, Thakur, Bhakti Siddhartha Sadasvati, and Bhakti Vinod Prabhupada, is the kind of the global universal outlook. Mm -hmm. I mean, not all movements thought that their uh, tradition um, should uh, uh, be communicated beyond uh, Hindu community, Good. even yeah. uh, their, um, their kind of Bengali community or family community. So, I wonder, did the talk, uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, think that was yes. an important part of this? Of right. This, uh, so, in fact, uh, this, is, this is a very significant point. In fact, Bhakti Vinod Thakur uh, mentioned this time and again in his, uh, in his various uh, letters as well as uh, in, in his autobiography also he mentioned it, that it is important to reach out. He said he translated things into English, not just in Bengali, he translated things into English, he wrote uh, in English and these were sent by him to universities abroad. In fact, at the Megal University in Canada, you have books which have been sent by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. You have uh, these books traveling to several places in the 19th century itself during the lifetime of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So his inspiration and attitude was as much global as uh, the later gurus uh, and later uh, leaders tried to make it. But he was unable to uh, globalize or to reach out in the same manner, perhaps uh, during his lifetime, because of several other constraints. Uh, and he passed away pretty early, around 1914, uh, although he was uh, quite of an uh, old age at that time. But uh, his son, uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, took the lead and he tried to expand the network of temples all across the globe. 64 temples, as we all know, were set up in different parts of the world, including in London and in Berlin and in Thailand as well, uh, Burma, uh, in Rangoon, yeah, apart from India. So the globalizing attitude, the need to reach out, the need to modernize was there among all three. Perhaps not in equal measure, but it was there. Thank you very much. Shantanu, thank you, Knut. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This was the first session. Now, next, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, our Fernando Sabella, from here from Stockholm University. He's associate professor here in the Department of History of Religions. Uh, he's going to speak to us on the biographies of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Walter Eidlitz and Bhaktivedanta Swami. As our world becomes more and more connected, the exchange between Eastern and Western philosophical traditions increases, displaying our mutual commitment to the exploration of important existential questions. This presentation briefly examines the thought of Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thaku, Walter Eidlitz, and A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, all of whom upheld the Gaudiya or Bengal Vaishnava perspective on consciousness. The goal here is to context contextualize their viewpoints with the aim of bridging geographical, cultural, and philosophical divides. India has a long history of exploring questions concerning consciousness and the purpose of human existence. With its rich traditions and ancient Sanskrit texts, India has generated a number of great religious thinkers that have opined about, uh, about we indi individual selves and our relationship with the Supreme Absolute, that which is said to lie be beyond our perceptual and cognitive capacities. The Vedas, some of the oldest religious texts on the planet, introduce in the Upanishads the idea of Atman, 
that is the individual self or soul, noting that it exists beyond the temporary layers of body, mind and intellect. This is confirmed in the Bhagavata Gita, perhaps the most popular Hindu text, where Krishna states, Never truly have I ever not existed, nor you, nor these kings who protect the people, and never shall any of us ever cease to be, now or forever more. Here we are provided with a basic Indic understanding of the Atman, our true eternal self or consciousness, which continues onwards even after the cessation of all temporal functions. Over the centuries, the philosophic debate regarding the precise nature of that consciousness has generated two fundamental Indic schools of thought. Non-dualism, which has evolved over time to encompass a number of non-dual perspectives, and dualism, which also has evolved over time to encompass a number of dualistic perspectives. Shankara's Advaita, non-dual Vedanta, which is anchored in the Upanishads, posits that the perception that consciousness is individually divided into separate units is an illusion, and that in the ultimate sense, consciousness, Brahman, is undifer undifferentiated oneness, its essence. Then there is the Vaishnava tradition, which over the centuries has posited various forms of dualism that provide a view of consciousness that markedly differs from the monistic view. Vaishnavism's personalist focus is on devotion to Vishnu in one or another of his various forms. This point of view posits that the Atma, or individual soul, while being part of the Supreme Soul, or Brahman, always remain individual and distinct from that soul, even after the death of the temporary body. The Vaishnava tradition thus emph emphasizes the personal nature of the Absolute Truth, focusing on the bond or connection between the minute, eternal persons and the Supreme Person, the eternal origin of all existences. This very brief explanation of two highly intricate, yet dichotomous philosophic understandings of consciousness affords a glimpse into the richness and variegatedness of Indic thought on the subject of consciousness. Chaitanya, in the 16th century, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu founded the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition in Northeast India. His teaching represents a significant de development in Vaishnavism's understanding of individual consciousness and its connection to Brahman, supreme or universal consciousness. What, is, what distinguishes this tradition from other forms of dualism is the understanding that the individual self is inconceivably simultaneously one with and different from the Supreme Self, particularly identified in the Bhagavata Purana, the primary Gaudiya Vaishnava text, as Krishna. The tradition is also distinguished by its division of love for Krishna, God, into a number of progressive developmental stages up to the highest stage of unmotivated, unconditional, spontaneous love for God, which is said to be gradually attained through the practice of Bhakti Yoga. Born in 1874, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur emerged as a pivotal figure in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. Under the guidance of his father, Kedana Datta Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Bhaktisiddhanta was exposed to a blend of deep spiritual wisdom and modern thought. Grounded in Gaudiya teachings, he viewed consciousness as the very essence of self, deeply aligned with Krishna consciousness. Bhaktisiddhanta contended that while this consciousness often becomes clouded by material entanglements due to the three gunas, or material qualities, explaining both the ancient Sankhya philosophy and the Bhagavad Gita, it can be revived through spiritual practice. This is a meeting that the uh, governor of Bengal, John Anderson, did in Mayapur, Navadvip, where is the birthplace of Chaitanya, and visited Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, so you can see, you can see on the right. That was in 1935. 
The 20th century, marked by colonial influences and the onset of Western scientific thought in India, presented both challenges and opportunities. Bhaktisiddhanta actively sought to bridge Gaudiya Vaishnavism with Western para paradigms. He embraced technology, and especially print media, to disse disseminate Gaudiya principles and teachings. In his, in his engagement with the West, Bhaktisiddhanta presented Gaudiya Vaishnavism not as, more, as mere religious ritual, but as a sophisticated philosophical system. He presented Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as a saintly divine personality, the Sanskrit Chaitanya translates but also as pure consciousness. Bhaktisiddhanta wrote extensively, fostered disciples like A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who he met in Kolkata in 1922, and tasked them with making this wisdom available in English, the European link to audiences around the world. In summary, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur not only preserved the core tenets of the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, but also served to expand it, its scope. His efforts fostered a dialogue between Indian spirituality and Western intellectual thought, thus enriching global perspectives on consciousness. Walter Eidlitz, later known as Vaman Das, undertook an intellectual journey that traversed traverse diverse cultural landscapes and ideologies. Born in 1892, amidst the culturally rich fer fervor of Vienna, Eidlitz initially immersed himself in the literary and philosophical traditions of Europe, writing several books in this regard. However, while Western philosophical traditions nurture his formative spiritual inquiries, a profound inner longing for answers to life's most important questions drew him toward Indic thought. The social-political upheavals of Europe, intensified by two world wars, had a profound effect on Eidlitz's worldview. He concluded that the intellectual rationalist advancements of the West, though commendable, seemed to lack a sufficiently profound understanding of consciousness and the ultimate purpose of human existence. It was this realization that directed his gaze toward the East. That was just before the Second World War. When, during a journey to the East in the 1930s, Eidlitz began to study India's various spiritual traditions, he eventually became interested in Vaishnavism, and in Gaudiya Vaishnavism in particular. Through his study of sacred Sanskrit texts like the Bhagavata Purana and the writings of the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, Chaitanya's key disciples, Eidlitz became acquainted with a variety of Gaudiya Vaishnava perspectives, particularly with respect to the topic of consciousness. Eidlitz's understanding of consciousness thus evolved from the view that it was a mere epiphenomenon of neuro neuro neurological brain functions to the view that consciousness was the essential, essential symptom of existence, meant to be engaged in eternal relationship with the Supreme Being himself, the source of all conscious beings. These conceptions of consciousness resonate well the Gaudiya Vaishnava conception, wherein pure consciousness is equated to Krishna consciousness, a state wherein the self, unencumbered by worldly constraints, recognizes its permanent association and relationship with the Supreme Person. Eidlitz's literary contribution in Sweden are exemplified by his book Krishna Chaitanya, Sein Leben und Seine Lehre, translated as Krishna Chaitanya, His Life and Teachings, which was published in 1968 by Stockholm University's Department of History of Religions. He became then later a honorary doctor in Lund University. Like his other works, this book combines Western academic rigor with a genuine quest for spiritual knowledge and wisdom. Both his Swedish and his German works provide a harmonious bridge making the East's complex spiritual understandings more accessible to a European continental audience. Eidlitz's transformative journey from being a European intellectual to becoming Vandas, a devotee and scholar of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, is a testament to Vaishnavism's transformative character. His life and work highlight the universality of the quest for understanding consciousness and the existential questions that surround it. 
a quest that transcends geographical, cultural, and temporal boundaries. The dissemination of Gaudiya Vaishnavism beyond the Indian subcontinent is in, in, inextricably linked with the efforts of A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, born in 1896 as Abhai Charande in Kolkata, West Bengal, Bhakti Vedanta Swami's early years were influenced by both indigenous Indian spirituality and British colonialism. Kolkata being the jewel in the crown of the British Empire at that time. This unique cultural intersection would later come to inform and shape its global mission. From a young age, Prabhupada's spiritual orientation was deepened through guidance from his mentor, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, which he met in 1922. Yet the full blossoming of his spiritual journey and mission came to fruition in his later years. In 1965, at the age of 69, Prabhupada embarked on a voyage to New York City, thereby inaugurating the period of Gaudiya Vaishnavism's full global migration. Prabhupada's nuanced understanding of consciousness was deeply rooted in the Gaudiya tradition. Unlike many contemporary interpretations of consciousness, Prabhupada emphasized its transcendental dimension. He presented consciousness as a symptom of the eternal self, distinct from the body and the mind, emphasizing that the natural condition of individual consciousness is to be situated in a harmonious, loving relationship with Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. His aim in the West was to introduce Radha and Krishna as the feminine and masculine aspect of Godhead. While this understanding was novel in the West, it was familiar within traditional Vaishnavism, a prominent branch of the modern Hindu umbrella. His seminal work, works included English translations of the Bhagavad Gita as it is and the Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavata Purana, as well as an English translation of the Bengali Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. His numerous commentaries within these works seamlessly melded profound philosophical insights with practical spiritual guidance. During the 1960s and 70s, these texts served as conduits that guided numerous disenchanted Westerners toward the ancient wisdom of India. Among Prabhupada's unique contributions in the creation of what he called summary studies of two Sanskrit and one Bengali work, all three of which are highly significant within the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. Krishna book uh, that was um, uh, funded by George Harrison from Beatles, which is based on the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, focused on Krishna's transcendental pastimes. Number two, the Nectar of Devotion, which is based on Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And three, the teaching of Lord Chaitanya, which is based on Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami's Chaitanya Charitamrita. In these works, Prabhupada departed from the traditional commentarial style of presenting Sanskrit works and instead adopted a narrative style that seemingly wove texts, insights, and explanations into a highly appealing whole. This distinctly approach, possibly the first of its kind within the tradition, made the original literatures far more accessible to the average Western reader. Prabhupada's establishment of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, or ISKCON, became a transformative force in the lives of numerous individuals throughout the world. The Hare Krishna movement, as it, is baking, uh, as it became popularly known, introduced a complete devotional lifestyle to a largely Western audience that was wholly unfamiliar with the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, which included a variety of principles, uh, precepts and practices, such as mantra meditation and kirtan, that helped individuals to advance along the path of bhakti devotion. By this means, many Westerners began to explore consciousness not just as a theoretical construct, but rather as a daily life experience. Beyond this, Prabhupada's dialogues with prominent Western intellectual, intellectuals afforded a number of insightful comparative religious and philosophical interchanges. These dialogues touched upon topics such as the nature of consciousness, the juxtaposition of material and spiritual realities, and the challenging relation between science and spirituality. 
This is uh, speeches that uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada gave in Uppsala University when he came here in September 1973. In essence, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada's mission was not solely about the global propagation of a religious doctrine. It also was the invitation to a global audience to embark upon an inner journey, to explore the depths of their own consciousness, and to discover the profound love and devotion that lies at the heart of the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. Though this enduring legacy and teachings, Prabhupada presented a vision of consciousness that was ancient and timeless, yet also deeply re relevant to modern persons seeking meaning in an increasingly complex world. Concluding, concluding remarks, figures like Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, Walter Eidlitz, and Bhaktivedanta Swami epitomized the productive relationship between Gaudiya Vaishnavism and Western thought. Their life stories, repl replete with intellectual engagements and attempts at cultural integration, highlight the Gaudiya perspective on consciousness and its future potential for interplay with Western philosophers, such as Socrates and Plato, as well as modern philosophies such as Christian personalism. Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati's biography exemplifies the fervor of a scholar deeply rooted in the Indic tradition. Among his various accomplishments, he helped lay the grand groundwork for the dissemination of Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophies in the West. But the Ayurveda's journey uh, sim symbolizes the genuine academic and personal quest of many Western seekers attracted to various levels of yoga. Encountering Gaudiya Vaishnavism, he plunged into his depths examining its philosophies and presenting them in a manner understandable to his Western audience, acting as a bridge between the two worlds. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada's story is a chronicle of Gaudiya Vaishnavism's rapid global migration between the years 1965 and 1977. Through his writings, teachings and the establishment of ISKCON, he imparted Gaudiya Vaishnavism's profound insights on the matter of consciousness, emphasizing both its scholarly and its experiential significance. Western academia, exemplified by early works such as Larry Sheen's The Dark Lord, Cult Images and the Hare Krishnas in America from 1987, provides sociological and philosophical perspectives on Gaudiya Vaishnavism's adaption and challenges in the West. It enriches our comprehension of the interplay between different philosophical, historical and cultural systems. Set against the backdrop of the Enlightenment era's philosophies and the rise of scientific rationalism, the Gaudiya Vaishnava perspective offers intricate and nuanced insights into individual experiences and perceptions of consciousness. In summation, the dialogue between Gaudiya Vaishnavism and Western philosophy provides a compelling area of study, especially in terms of the opportunities for mutual exchange provided by cultural globalization. The three significant figures cited above provide us with invaluable insights with regard to the multifaceted nature of consciousness and humanity's perennial endeavor to understand it. These cross-cultural engagements, underscored by mutual respect and rigorous inquiry, pave the way for a richer, more integrated understanding of one of humanity's <coughs> most profound inquiries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sardella. I would again like to call our discussant, Professor Knut Jakobsen. So, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fagnano Sardella, for this very uh, rich and interesting presentation. Uh, on the importance of consciousness and the idea, idea of uh, Bhaktivedanta and uh, Bhaktivedanta synthesizing Eastern and Western uh, perception. Uh, in your paper also, we meet the universalization of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Uh, of this line of uh, Acharyas. Uh, this uh, universalism is somewhat unusual and a contrast with many other Hindu uh, movements uh, at the time is quite uh, striking. Uh, most Hindu movements at the time uh, of Bhaktisiddhanta would not uh, 
think of anything non-Hindus. So there is this uh, strong universalizing uh, uh, motivation. And uh, uh, you argue that uh, the study of human consciousness uh, needs to include uh, also uh, I mean, non-Western knowledge traditions uh, and uh, Indian religions are indeed uh, knowledge uh, traditions with many similarities with Western traditions of uh, theology and philosophy. Uh, so, uh, my question, first question would be that uh, on what issued, issues uh, uh, did the most fruitful encounters of Gaudiya Vaishnavism and Western traditions of knowledge take place? Uh, you mentioned in, in, in your uh, presentation that there were these uh, uh, encounters, but you didn't uh, specify that much, so I became yeah. curious. Yes, so. thank you for your important question. Uh, well, the back background is, uh, uh, as you mentioned already, that the Gaudiya Vaishnavism as a philosophy is not very well known in the West as yet. Uh, then. Uh, there was some efforts by Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati to con connect during the colonial period to London and one of his disciples, Sambhidananda Das, he uh, was sent to London, he wrote a, a thesis with the London University uh, about the history of uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism from Madhva, the 12th century in Kerala, up to that time, the 1930s. He got his PhD, I think, in 1935. Uh, so that there was some kind of effort by Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati to, to make Gaudi Vaishnavism very much more known. So in terms of uh, connection with the West that we can uh, kind of see how it looks like today, I mentioned Plato and, and Socrates as the Greek philosophy. And there is some reasons to that, because uh, Socrates and Plato, uh, basically Socrates, Plato, he, he, wrote his manuscripts as dialogues with Socrates. Uh, they happened a few hundred years before Christ. At the same time, in India, the Sramana movement in, with yoga, we have some similarity in their understanding of consciousness and the fact that we live in a cave in the Republic book by, by Plato that explained it. So I'm, I'm just... Uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism has a uh, language is Sanskrit. It's very difficult to translate into English. Uh, so I'm just thinking different ways where they can start to get in touch with each other. They're different, obviously. And Gaudiya Vaishnavism is still quite unknown in the West. But one way would be to connect maybe to the, starting with the Greeks, the Greek philosophy, because uh, Plato is considered to be the father of Western philosophy. Uh, or I mentioned also the uh, Western, uh, the Christian personalism, uh, which was very strong in Boston in the 19th century, is still alive and very active in the United States and in Europe, in Poland and in many countries in Europe, because it's focus. It has a Christian basic that we ha we have individuality, and and the idea of personalism was very influential in the human rights in New York after the Second World War. To to uh, uh, give respect, that we should respect children, wa uh, women, and men in the same way. Uh, so, these are just uh, an, uh, an approach. There's nothing really there. And in Indian philosophies in the West, it's still very, it's not very much developed. And uh, many Indian philosophies, uh, Indologies, departments have been closed down. So, there are many different aspects that need to be considered. but. I would love to uh, encourage, so to speak, in the future. Thank you. Do I have time for one more question? Sure. So, uh, yes, so this is a, a shorter one. I mean, the history of uh, Walter Eidlitz uh, is a really interesting one. I'm, I always found this early European engagement with Hindu traditions uh, interesting. These are often unusual individuals uh, who have. Uh, remarkable uh, life stories uh, and um, I was also there curious for some more information I mean uh, uh, 
Hal Vidyan countered, uh, Vidyan countered Gaudiya Vaishnavis, did he encounter it first in Austria or did he encounter it first in India and, and who, who did he encounter? Yes, thank you for a very important question. He, uh, he's, uh, he went, when he traveled to, to India, he, he started uh, to visit, uh, he wanted to visit Tibet and he had the journeys, but then he was arrested by the British uh, because he was from Austria. And, and there uh, he met Sadananda Das, and, uh, who was uh, from Leipzig, from Germany, and who, who was already initiated by Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, and had a very deep understanding of Sanskrit and Bhagavata Purana. So during the war, for about four to five years, they, he started to learn from him. And that's how he got this idea of Gaudiya Vaishnavis, basically during the war in, the, in, the, in that place. So that's how he started. And then after, after, after the war, Walter Eidrit's wife, she had moved to, to Sweden, so he followed her. And, and then he started working on this new book uh, about Krishna Chaitanya. So that's a little bit of the background. Mm -hmm. uh, it came definitely with a personal encounter, because it was so, uh, so unknown, even, uh, but, but among the Westerners in India. Yeah. So he encountered the lineage of this. Uh, Yes, it did. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We still have one uh, talk left in this session, so I, you, you're very patient and, and, and uh, good listeners. So uh, our next presentation is by Willy Fentner, he's a retired senior lecturer in philosophy of religion, uh, and he was also uh, one of the persons who brought Iskand to Sweden and invited Bhaktivedanta Swami here uh, 50 years ago. So we're very, very happy to introduce him today. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank. Uh, Fernando Sardella for arranging this workshop in commemoration of uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami's visit to Sweden 50 years ago and speaking at this very place on this very day uh, 50 years ago. So uh, my paper is about uh, the experience we had when Prabhupada spoke in different places and met uh, the public in Sweden. And it's uh, the title, A Cultural Challenge, Bhaktivedanta Swami confronts the radical left in Sweden. It was a very special time in the beginning of the 70s, very much left-wing and communist influence. Uh, we established a temple in uh, Sweden just a few months before, in July, in a building, a villa in Spona, a suburb of Stockholm. And uh, we were just a few devotees here in Sweden at the time, about six, seven. But about 50 came up from Germany to, for the occasion. And this is a picture with uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami in front of the temple of the time with all the devotees present. Shortly after Bhaktivedanta Swami's visit to Sweden, there appeared an article in Dans Nyheter, the biggest Swedish morning newspaper. <coughs> the headline was Hare Krishna, Ryakrumans Verktig, um, which can be the tool of reaction, Hare Krishna. The author of the article was Shashin Strandberg, a Swedish writer politically oriented towards the left. She had attended Bhaktivedanta Swami's lecture here at Stockholm University. Left-wing politics was dominating the Swedish cultural and political milieu at the time. In the US, the uh, United States Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palme was considered a persona non grata due to his intense critique of the Vietnam War. 
But the Swedish criticism was not only against war and violence, it was also imbued with a critique of capitalism in favor of socialism and even communism. Many influential Swedes were very were even supporting Pol Pot's regime in Cambodia, at least until the terrible genocide was uh, revealed. There were many small revolutionary communist parties who were very active on the music, drama, and literary scene. To be admitted to the journalist college, at least some said that you had to be left-wing, otherwise you were not considered to be politically aware. Uh, um, so most journalists were left-wing, even those who worked at liberal and even right-wing newspapers. And Doris Nyheter is politically liberal, but at the time it was strongly leaning towards the left. Strandberg claims in an article that the appearance of the Hare Krishna movement in, is part of the political project. She ascertains that during the counterculture of the 60s, when young people took a stand against the established values of the established society, two strands developed. One was political activism, where young people worked for a change of the capit capitalist system. The other was the non-political hippie movement, influenced by the Eastern thought, opting for a change of the individual person. Strandberg's claim is that the second religiously inspired stand, in which he also includes other so-called new, new religious movements, the Jesus movement and so on, was not genuine, but the result of a planned reaction to the political activists to calm it down and pacify it by manipulating the youth to give up and be content with the sub subordination to authority. Evidence of this she sees in the Hare Krishna devotees prostrations in front of their guru, Bhaktivedanta Swami. During the lecture, Bhaktivedanta had mentioned and disclaimed the foolish accusation in India that the Hare Krishna movement got financial support from CIA, which had been an issue even in the Indian parliament, but where it was finally dismissed due to persons who were more had got insight into the matter that it was supported by book distribution and donations. Strandberg, however, uses a long section in an article to argue for the possibility that the Hare Krishna movement may have indeed been supported by CIA and that it was a smart move by Bhaktivedanta to ridicule the idea during his lecture. That an article could be published in the biggest Swedish morning newspaper is an indication of the general culture and political atmosphere in Sweden at the time. It was obvious that the writer was in favor of anti-capitalist activism. Also in the streets of Stockholm, there were many communist groups and different types, Marxists, Trotskyists, Maoists, demonstrating and distributing pamphlets. And the Krishna devotees on Sankirtan and book distribution were often met with contemptuous, contemptuous language and behavior from these people. The hippie movement from which Eskon in the beginning recruited most of his members did not attract the Swedish youth nearly as much as did communist groups. Apart from the lecture at Stockholm University, Bhaktivedanta Swami had two lectures at Uppsala University, one at the philosophical department and one public in the main university building. He also lectured at Sigtuna Stiftelsen, which is a foundation based on Krishna, uh, Christian values, open to dialogue with other religious religions, and also offers a scene for cultural programs in general. But Vedanta also spoke two days in a row at the Hare Krishna festival with Prasadam and Kirtan arranged in Kårhuset, which was at the student union facilities in central Stockholm rented by Iskand for the occasion. The themes of the public lectures were generally basic, straightforward, uncompromising Krishna conscious teachings. Bhaktivedanta did not adjust the message like so many of the historian and ideologist A.L. Basham had called streamlined swamis, what they had done before him. 
At all the public lectures he spoke from a Vyasa son, a kind of throne, greeted by surrounding prostrating disciples. This was not to the liking of a large part of the audience. Sweden is a country where one generally is very critical towards authoritarianism and hierarchical structures. Even the prime minister, the prime minister at the time, Olof Palme, was moving among, around as an ordinary citizen and living in a modest row house in the suburb to Stockholm. At the lectures of the university on the 6th of September, Bhaktivedanta speaks about Vedic knowledge as perfect and quoted Srimad Bhagavatam 113, that Bhagavatam being the ripened fruit of Vedic knowledge. He contrasts it to material science, which is imperfect. He talks about the sun planet and the sun god, Vivashram, and how the knowledge has come down through the disciplic succession. He speaks about 8,400,000 species of life, knowledge given in Vedic literature. And he states that within the depart all departments is knowledge avail available in Vedic literature, in geography, philosophy, religion, sociology, sociology politics. He speaks about uh, the child devotee, Prahlad Maharaj, and how the Vedic knowledge should be taught to children. And he speaks about a dharma, that dharma cannot be changed. It is real religion, not faith like Hinduism, Christianity, Islam. It does not refer to the body, but the spirit soul beyond the designations. So the main purpose in education should be to understand God, not business or economic development. Nature is working under the control of God, not independently. We should learn to our relationship to God and God is not Christian, Hindu, or Muslim. The main themes of the public lectures are that Vedic knowledge is perfect, while empirical knowledge is imperfect, since our senses are imperfect and we are under illusion, committing mistakes. And he states that the purpose of Vedic knowledge is to know God and can be understood through the three angles of vision, Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, can be realized through bhakti, devotion, the highest form of yoga as explained in Bhagavad Gita. We must understand the difference between human and animal life. Animals are engaged in eating, sleeping, mating, defending. As humans, we should understand that we are part and parcel of God, that we are eternal, full of knowledge and blissful, that we are not the body which is made up by Krishna's gross and subtle Energy, material energies, but we are spirit, soul, transmigrating from body to body, and the process of bhakti yoga is to make us realize this. However, at the different theme was brought up at the Hare Krishna feast at Kaur Huset on September 8th, Bhaktivedanta sang verses from Brahma Sunita and spoke about the spiritual realm, Goloka Vindava, how everything there is made of Chintamani, of spiritual energy, and where Krishna engages in his lila and pastimes with gopis, milkmaids, in blissful rasa, taste of relation. I don't know if this is true, but from what I heard, that was the first time Bhaktivedanta spoke publicly about Krishna, lila, and the spiritual real. This was at Kaur Huset Sokol. And uh, at the philosophical department at Uppsala University on September 7th, Bhaktivedanta lectured on the 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, titled Nature and Joy and Consciousness. The lecture centers on God, Krishna, as all attractive, as having form and being the supreme controller. Our own true nature is the same as Krishna's, Satchit Ananda, eternal, full of knowledge and bliss. The purpose of our life being to understand our real identity, our relationship to God, and act accordingly. We should transform lust into love of God through Bhakti Yoga. The questions after the lecture were scarce. There was a question about Veda, and the question seemed to, questioners seemed to 
make a distinction between the Vedas and Bhagavad Gita. Bhaktivedanta answers that the Veda means knowledge and that ultimate knowledge is knowing knowledge of God, which is the aim of Bhagavad Gita. A question about Brahman follows and about the meaning of God being a person, which is was generally not uh, known at the time that that could be an interpretation. After the lecture and due to the seeming lack of interest among the philosophers, on the way, on the way to the public lecture at the main university building, Bhaktivedanta asked what sweets are interested in. <laughs> and we answer uh, that politics is a topic of great interest. So Bhaktivedanta commences his lecture by explaining how human society should be structured and divided into four classes, quoting Bhagavad Gita 4.13. There should be first class, second class, third class, fourth class, based on qualities and work. He makes an analogy to the human body, first class Brahmana, his head, second class Kshatra, the arms, third class the Vaishya, the belly, and the fourth class Shudra, the legs. These parts should cooperate for proper function. Bhaktivedanta then goes on to state what qualities or modes of nature dominate the respective classes. First class goodness, second class passion, and third class passion and ignorance, fourth class ignorance. Then follows the characterization of different classes and the function in society. Bhaktivedanta also criticizes the idea of classless society and claims that there must be classes. This lecture causes quite a stir in the audience. <laughs> and some challenging questions followed, as for example, so what are you? First class? To which Bhaktivedanta answers, no, I'm fifth class, since I am the servant of everyone. After the event, many stayed and confronted the devotees. The atmosphere got very tense on the verge of violence. In Sweden, the spiritual aspect of the counterculture of the time was not as prominent as in the US and UK, but it was not completely absent. Some so-called new religious movements had open centers and a few followers, and an occasional New Age bookstore had opened. However, these phenomena were generally ridiculed by media and the society at large. Sweden was, and is even today, a prominently secular society, where religious and existential questions are seldom on the agenda. Even the Swedish church has secularized itself and adjusted, as the religious scholar Ninja Smart suggested, adapted social democratic values. Uh, focus on welfare, security, and solidarity. I studied philosophy in Uppsala University, where metaphysics and existential philosophy were dismissed. Analytical, logical positivism was dominating. Philosophy was in the service of natural science by supplying logic and, ex and conceptual and an analysis. And behaviorism was totally dominating the psychological department. And on the broader cultural scene, Marxism and Maoism were very much on the agenda, as seen from the perspective of the four goals of life, Purusharta, stated in Indian thought, Dharma, Arita, Kama, Moksha, religious duty, prosperity, sense gratification, and liberation. Everything was centered and viewed from the values of Arta and Kama, prosperity and sense gratification. So no wonder then that Bhaktivedanta Swami's matches, message of Dharma and Moksha did not find fertile soil. Oi! Wow! Okay, uh, this is lecture for it. Uh, so, uh, so, interestingly though, in if Bhaktivedanta Swami had come to Sweden 
and Uppsala 120 years earlier, the situation might have been different if the philosophical and axiological message would have uh, managed to transcend cultural and religious differences. The Swedish academic milieu was during the 19th century very different from now. Never before or after had philosophy had such a strong standing, not only at the universities, but also in society at large. It was compulsory for office bearers to study philosophy, and one could say that a certain philosophical school was dominant in Sweden, especially in Uppsala, during the main part of the 19th century. It was almost like a, a national philosophy in Sweden. As in Germany, philosophy in Sweden was at the time primarily different versions of idealism. And uh, pro there were prominent philosophers, Bieber, Gruber, and Boström, a professor in, in uh, philosophy at Uppsala University. The idealist philosophies of the German philosophers Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel had in different ways influenced the Swedish philosophers, and so had philosophy of the fideist philosopher Jacobi, who especially influenced Bieber and Gruber. It is well known that German idealists were familiar with Indian philosophies in different ways influenced by it. Their philosophies represent different kinds of idealism. Uh, however, uh, the Swedish ideals, uh, the, the unique character of Swedish idealism is that it was personalist. It was a theistic form of idealism that especially in the case of Bieber and Gruber was more in line with Christianity. Bostrom is, however, considered to be the greatest of the Swedish philosophers. His is not fideist like Bieber's and Gruber's, but more rationalistic and systematic. However, his philosophy is also personalist. Bostrom concludes that God must be a self-conscious being, a, a personality. In this sense, it is more akin to Indian theism than is German idealism. Bostrom also states that we are ideas in God, that God is a person and that we are persons, that we go through different forms of life to realize this. In his political philosophy, he also considers monarchy and a class society with four classes to be the best political system. So when it comes to views on what is the human being, what is the purpose of life, Bhaktivedanta Swami would have had much more in common with the professors at the philosophical department at Uppsala University in the 1850s than in the 1970s. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now again, I have the honor to call our discussant, Professor Jakobsen. Thank you. And thank you for this very interesting a presentation that brought us back to the 1960s and 70s. My first thought when I listened to it was so lucky Prabhupada was with the timing in the US in 1965 and so unlucky he was with the timing in Sweden in 1973. <laughs> <laughs> he should obviously have arrived 100 years before. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> So the, the two preceding papers brought us back to the 19th and early 20th century Bengal. And your paper took us back then to Sweden. Uh, and uh, your paper were really describing two colliding worlds. Uh, and uh, it reminded me also you know, how different uh, the culture was in the 1970s with uh, this strong, uh, publicly active authoritarian left-wing uh, uh, political movements. Uh, so you describe these, uh, you know, uh, negative reactions in the newspapers. And <coughs> uh, I found also a very useful review of Prabhupada's speeches and performances in Sweden. Uh, you know, and uh, very fascinating, you know, you show that the, the content of his teaching had more in common with Swedish or European uh, 
philosophy in the 19th century, then in the 20th, 20th. Um, and it made me think also that, I mean, uh, religious movements are very often, uh, you know, very much influenced from the time period that they originate. And, and uh, we learned that uh, Bhakti Vinod's who originated the movement was from that period of these uh, Swedish philosophers that you mentioned. And I, I wonder if that uh, uh, if that makes sense that is uh, or is it just that secularization had come much longer in, in Sweden than in India at the time? You mean uh, uh, at the uh, on the nineteenth century? You mean that that uh, I think I mean uh, the similarities. I mean the whole of I mean northern Europe, uh, Germany, and Sweden was very much uh, uh, idealist and romanticist. Um, that was dominating here at the time. Whether that that is a coincidence, of course, uh, many claim that the German. Idealism was also uh, influenced by Indian thinking because they had come in contact with Indian scriptures and they were very much inspired. I mean, Schelling was uh, enthusiastic about India, I mean, Hegel wasn't, but, <laughs> but, but many others. So, so, so that's, uh, I mean, there was some similarities at that time, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But in Sweden that had passed yeah. Yeah. by that time. Yeah. Uh, I found the uh, this, the comparison very useful. And, uh, uh, I wonder also if, if, if their epistemology should be uh, uh, also uh, researched, because that epistemology is now very much questioned in, in the Western culture. And, but, but their epistemologies also seem somewhat similar. Yes, of course it's, it's uh, I mean, there is a diff little difference between these the Swedish philosophers, like uh, one are, some are Fides, they are more in, in with the, have it, that it, there is a, an internal sense that can, they can sense God, I mean, and th there is a feeling, like Schleiermacher, I mean, they, they, they have this idea that there is something, that is a kind of revelation within the heart of this, uh, of, but but Bostrom was very much like Hegel in in the head. <laughs> Concept he, he meant that you conceptualize everything, yeah. and he and he so he was much more rationalistic in his in his way of, of coming to to the knowledge of God being a person. He he he, he argues for it very strongly that how how it, how it must be like that. Mm. But but of course every, all this is influenced by how after Kant when when they want to investigate the noumena, I mean, the transcendental eye, and what it means, and try to unify it in his philosophy, which, which was segmented in the practical and theoretical. So, so they try to do it in, a, in, a, in an idealist way, yes. by, by going with, the, with the, you know, in the, the rational or the fanuft, in the fanuft, which is the intelligent inner, there is difference between rational thinking and, and uh, I mean, Vernunft and Verstand in, 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 in German. So, and that's that's Vernunft that you can actually get that knowledge. But then, then of course, this all changed in the, in the, in the you know, and it became philosophy. Uh, it became anti-metaphysical, they say. But actually, what what was adapted was a Physicalist metaphysics. <laughs> yes. that, uh, so, but, but now I think there there is something within science, I mean, quantum physics, and the philosophy of mind. You know, the hard problem of consciousness. We are, I think, we are towards a paradigm shift in the future, yes. where where this is coming back. And then I think the rele re re relevance of of uh, Bhaktivedanta's family will become stronger. Again. On the, on the broader scene.
Thank you very much. I think that's a, a very nice note to, to end this session with. But uh, since you've been sitting so patiently, maybe we could take one question from the audience. Billy Fender, thank you very much for your interesting lecture as an insider. And uh, you were the one along with Vega uh, Van Fabu, Jorrit Sumpol, Val, who invited Bhaktivedanta Swami to uh, Stockholm. And uh, uh, I wonder, you were explaining how his message was not very much appreciated by the academia of the time. But still, Bhaktivedanta's movement found some. Uh, encountered some appreciation amongst Swedish youth, actually grew, grew quite fast, and there were many more Swedish followers uh, in Sweden than, for example, in Germany. There were the same number of Swedish followers in the early 70s as in Germany, although Sweden has a much smaller population. How would you explain that? Well, uh, I don't know what this... Uh, you, you can hear me now? Yeah? Yes, yeah. Whether this... Uh, it's true, I mean, uh, when, uh, when Prabhupada came here, we were only about six devotees in Sweden, and there were about 50, 60 from Germany coming. And uh, of course, in the end of the 70s, uh, the movement grew quite quickly here, when we got to the place outside Tombagis, Korshan School, and uh, so the, then we grew from about 15 to over 100 in, in maybe three, four years. But I think there was many more devotees in Germany at the time. So I don't think whether this is right. Of course, in, in Germany maybe it was not such... It was also quite hostile <laughs> against devotees and against the... I mean, the, there was not... The atmosphere was not as... As, as for example, in, in the, the hippie movement was not as big in Germany either like in America, because mo and most devotees that came, they were, they were dropouts <laughs> who left, turned against society and, and to find an alternative. But they, and of course there were people like that in Sweden, so because also. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, what, was that an answer to your question? Uh, because um, maybe I... Why, why did you think there was more devotees in Sweden than in Germany? Yeah. Uh, I was uh, in Sweden at that time, and I remember times we had 200 devotees in Sweden and uh, also 200 in Germany. Okay, so all right. Yeah. Like yeah. I'll remember that's true. And I mean, uh, Germany has about eight uh, yeah. times as yeah. Yeah. population. Yeah. Okay, we yeah, have got devotees. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, not everyone was communist. And even some communists became devotees. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we have uh, about 25 minutes break, and we continue at half past. See you then. So, uh, welcome back after the break. We are now at session two. Uh, which is titled Bhaktivedanta Swami and uh, Philosophy. We will have two papers in this uh, session, which will then last one hour. And as the preceding ses session, we will have a discussion after every presentation. So, Nirmalia uh, Narayan Shikravolti, Professor of Philosophy, will discuss each the paper. Each presenter has about 20 minutes. And we will start with uh, Graham Schweig, who is a professor at uh, GTU Berkeley, who will speak on original work teacher of the Krishna Bhakti, reflections on the nature of Swami Bhaktivedanta's philosophical discourse. Please. Uh, thank you. I wish to thank Ferdinando Sardella for the invitation to come here today. I'm enjoying my time, despite my jet lag. Uh, consciousness, but we'll, can, we'll go further. Now, the slides will be toward the end of the talk, so this is just for you to look at for now, but I'll be speaking most of the time, and then the slides come at the end. Prabhupada's gifts. Swami Bhaktivedanta's accomplishments mark the first time in history that a Krishna Bhakta successfully trained non-Indians in the orthodox disciplines of the Vaishnava tradition. 
and established communities of Krishna bhaktas permanently in the fabric of Western culture around the world. The number of historical and revolutionary feats that Prabhupada accomplished in the last 12 years of his life, from age 69 until his departure from this world at age 81, was truly phenomenal. In my view, the greatest gift that Prabhupada had to offer a world in great need was a teaching, a worldview, a way of life that essentially and most boldly asserted that all of reality, all the universe, is ultimately a loving place. In thousands of instances, both written and spoken, Prabhupada focused intensively on the love of God. It is a vision that stems from the worship of love, a divine love itself, an all-embracing love that tells us that life here, no matter how dismal, no matter how challenging, or no matter how dark and miserable this world can be, it is certainly a life worth living, and that there is a treasure of this divine presence, of this divine love within the hearts of all, a love, as Bhagavad Gita teaches, that is truly reflected in the most wonderful and beautiful things of this world. With the intense passion to honor his own spiritual teacher's desire to see the teachings and practices of Krishna Bhakti come to the West, Prabhupada arrived in the United States in 1965 from India. Indeed, it was Prabhupada's arrival in Boston that the worldwide Krishna movement got launched. Prabhupada recognized that persons, whether they be from affluent societies or poor societies, persons around the globe suffer from the impoverishment of the heart. And it was this that fu fueled Prabhupada's passion and dedication to nourish these hearts in a world that could be so terribly dark and miserable. A teaching on human and divine love. Now, we may ask, what is the single highest point of everything that Prabhupada came to teach? What he came to write, practice, and offer the world? What is central to his vision of the whole of Chaitanya Vaishnava philosophy? Although it may not be so obvious to the casual reader of Prabhupada's numerous books, or even to serious readers who may not have done a more fully informed study of Prabhupada's whole teaching, in all of his lectures, writings, and communications, Prabhupada propounded a very simple teaching, the love of God. After conducting much research into the nature of Prabhupada's discourse, whether written, published, spoken formally or informally, I have observed something significant. A basic grasp and distillation of the highest and most essential teaching that Prabhupada offered the world put in his own simple choice of words, happens to be the phrase, the love of God. There are thousands of instances in which Prabhupada used the phrase. Whether we find it in his published writings or in his conversations with clueless outside inquirers, as well as already well-informed followers and disciples, Prabhupada would resort to engaging the phrase most frequently and spontaneously. What is especially notice, notable is that the phrase love of God was how Prabhupada expressed what he was all about. Of all the ways that Prabhupada could have summarized his teachings and his purpose as a teacher, this brief and most concise phrase, love of God, spoke volumes about what he considered his life's mission. Many times interviewers, interviewers asked Prabhupada what it was that he was teaching. And Prabhupada's most often Prabhupada most often responded by saying something such as, Krishna consciousness is giving people the most sublime religion, love of God. That's all. We are teaching to love God. This is a direct quote. It is no wonder then that Prabhupada spoke and wrote this phrase, love of God, and slight variations thereof, such as love for God, loving God, etc., numerous times. If the phrase love of God is examined carefully as a seed 
to Prabhupada's whole philosophy, one finds that the word love and the word God each take on various synonyms in Prabhupada's discourse. And such synonymic forms are ways of stating love of God in just, in just Prabhupada's published works, uh, oh, in just Prabhupada's uh, published works, number into the tens of thousands, indicating, again, what is most essential, or the single highest point to everything he wrote and spoke. The phrase love of God has multivalent meanings, each of which is applicable in understanding Prabhupada's teachings. While it is obvious that one, particularly, one particular meaning dominates, and while it is evident that Prabhupada primarily intends one meaning over the others, the other meanings are just as applicable in illuminating Prabhupada's presentation of the philosophy and teachings of, Chaitanya Bhakti, of the Chaitanya Bhakti school. My analysis shows that the phrase of love of God applies to Prabhupada's philosophical presentation in the following four ways. Prema Bhakti, a Bhakta's love for God. Premodaya, the soul's dormant love for God. Bhagavat Prema, the love of God for souls. Prema Vesha, the all-pervasive love of God's innermost world. Love of God as prema bhakti focuses on humans as bhaktas, or those who have offered their hearts with the purest love to God, or, or the Bhagavat. Prabhupada most commonly intended this sense. However, other theologically poignant senses are worth recognizing here. Consider the second sense, love of God as premodaya, or dormant love of God. Drawing from many scriptural references, Prabhupada speaks about this dormant love in the sense that lying deep within the soul is a latent capacity to love and ultimately to love God. Quote, everyone has got natural love for God, unquote, he said. Interestingly, Prabhupada recognizes that love itself is an intrinsic constituent element of the self. Quote, love exists inside everyone, every living entity. So in this sense, Prabhupada was establishing a kind of anthropological theolo theology. He, he began with something that is uh, uh, undeniably uh, the case at a human level. Why does Prabhupada do this? Prabhupada explains, quote, therefore Bhagavatam says that it is that type of religion which is executed simply to develop the dormant love. Everyone has got dormant love of God. That is natural, because we are all parts and parcels of God. Prabhupada warns that while all souls have love imb embedded deeply within the depths of the heart, it can nevertheless, nevertheless be misused. Quote, and our attempt is to awaken the dormant love of Krishna. Everyone has got love. The stock of love is there, but it is being misused. Again, it is a matter of awakening and developing the dormant love from deep within the soul. Otherwise, the conditioning powers of the phenomenal world, including the trigunya filtration system, cause the soul to forget this opportunity to develop this love of God. And I quote, actually we are teaching the science of God. We are teaching how to develop our dormant propensity to love God. Being parts and parcels of the Supreme, we have got an eternal affinity to love God. Unfortunately, by our contact with matter, we have practically forgotten that we are eternally related to God. Unquote. Thus, at the very core of Prabhupada's vision and all of the practices he taught, is the foundational principle of love, a dormant love that is awakened, cultivated in bhakti, a practiced, refined, and eventually realized love. It, is ultimately, it ultimately blossoms into prema bhakti, a love that is perfected in the world of the divine love, of divine love, prema bhakti rasa, a phrase that only appears once in the Chaitanya Chaitanya, these three words, 
that are um, cited uh, hundreds of times, prema, bhakti, and rasa. The only time these three are put together is in one verse in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. So I treat it as a kind of paribhasha sutra. Love of God as Bhagavat the prema focuses on God as the Bhagavat, or the one who embraces all portions of reality with divine love, prema, especially for humans as bhaktas. And the love of God as prema vesha focuses on the prema within the intimate acts, divine acts of the Godhead, especially for the intimate divine acts as leelas or the, of the Bhagavat. Put simply, Prabhupada's teachings present one, the love from humans for God, two, the love for God that lies dormant within the hearts of souls, three, the love from, from God for souls, especially humanly embodied ones, and four, the love and its energy that is eternally activated within the highest and most intimate dimensions of the Godhead itself. And Prabhupada provides his Uttama vision for the movement he founded and for the followers who would sustain it. The movement as a place in which one's Tamasa and Rajasa perspectives may be purified and elevated to a Sattvika vision of reality where lust becomes love. Quote, the, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Krishna consciousness movement is so nice that you can transfer your lust into love. Unquote. It is a reversal of the heart's selfishness to the loving state of selflessness. In other words, for the self to be transformed from an intrinsically self-centered existence, as the term ahankara conveys, to a more profound orientation of the true self centered upon another and ultimately the supreme other, which we might term as Paramanyakara, a word that I made up. But I think it describes what Prabhupada is doing. He further divides his whole movement with respect to purification of the heart. Our Krishna conscious movement is not a religious movement. So here he's, before I read a quote where Prabhupada said this is the ultimate religious uh, uh, discussion that he presents. And here he says it's not a religious movement. And he says, it is a movement for purifying the heart. And, and the heart, he tells us, is purified by transforming lust into love, by focusing on the single highest point, or love of God. We must conclude here, then, that in the most distilled fashion, it is assuredly love of God, or love of God, or, I'm sorry, or love of Krishna, and the purification of the heart that are at the heart of Prabhupada's teachings for the world. Indeed, Prabhupada was delivering the most essential theme of Chaitanya Vaishnava thought, and I quote, pure love for Krishna is eternally established in the hearts of the living entities. It is not something to be gained from another source. When the heart is purified by hearing and chanting, this love naturally awakens. In conclusion, then, we can articulate in the simplest terms the very seed principle, the very gift that Prabhupada offered to the world, the philosophy of love of God, Krishna Prima, and the profound practices and way of life for attaining it, bhakti. But we can still, we can distill things even further. Prabhupada has served countless times as anyone acquainted with his teachings and his discourses knows, you're not this body. This was stated hundreds of thousands of times. But the significant underlying message of this assertion can be understood as the following. In the very essence of your eternal conscious being lies the source of the purest energy of love that must be awakened from within the heart so it can flow forever. Let it be affirmed here that Prabhupada presented plain and simple a philosophy of love. And if such a philosophy of love were to be broken down into eight principles, they, may, they might sound like this. 
a yoga of love. Uh, this is, because I did this study of Prabhupada's teachings, I said, you know what? This is what he's really talking about, uh, the yoga of love. And so my uh, future book coming out um, will be uh, titled exactly that. So the first principle, love is God because love conquers all, even God. In the Ras Mandala, <clears throat> those many of you here know the story, know the great Mila. Um, Krishna is conquered by the love of his Rajagopikas, his beloved Rajagopikas. Two, the supreme embrace of love is found within the divine. I call this the inward gaze of divinity. This is the inward gaze of divinity. Divinity yearns for the love of humans despite its supreme completeness. So this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is both divinity and devotee in one. And notice the outward gaze of the bhakta exhibited here. Um, but again, desiring the love from the human hearts. Thus a divine love call is sent out to awaken all souls. This was a recently commissioned painting by myself, commissioned by me, uh, for uh, Kim Waters to paint this. So, the love call. This is, you know, this is essential to the whole bhakti theology. Divine, number five, divine love breaks through the human condition in various powerful ways. And here's one of the Vrajagopikas breaking out of her home at night to dance with Krishna in the forest. Divine love and the human response to it cannot be eclipsed by anything. She's still working on this painting. This is where one of the, some of the Vrajagopikas could not leave uh, their homes. So since they couldn't go to the forest to embrace Krishna from without, they went into yoga meditation to embrace Krishna from within. And you can see she is embracing Krishna from within, which is the highest samadhi. Number seven, souls become immersed in a life absorbed in releasing the love residing within the heart. Krishna's world is just filled with love all around. And this is, I think, beautifully a B.G. Sharma painting illustrating that. Finally, souls enter into an eternal world of love when divinity calls our souls to dance. It's almost a mantra. When divinity calls our souls to dance. Prabhupada established sacred images in temples of Radha and Krishna, who are both offering an outward gaze of divinity. We saw earlier the inward gaze of divinity in the Ras Mandala. Here, both Radha and Krishna are calling the hearts of all souls. And this is what every Krishna Bhakta in ISKCON meditates on. This is the inward gaze. And the Maha Mantra, as I've insisted in the conclusion of one of my books, is but the <clears throat> sonnet representation of the Ras Mandala, the Maha Mantra. And just winding up, I see the wind up face right here. Yeah. Um, thank you. Hello. I don't know what to what to uh, you know comment on after this looking at this you know uh, pictures of Ras and Leela. Mm. I mean, I'm reminded of uh, you know the conversation that Chaitanya had with Rai Ramananda. Mm. Uh, uh, you know when uh, uh, he was Rai Ramananda was uh, responding to Chaitanya about well, uh, the difference, difference the of, yeah. of mm -hmm. sadhana. And at the end, when when you know Ramananda talked about Radha Bhava, Chaitanya actually you know put his arms on his uh, on Ramananda's uh, mouth so that we couldn't speak. So, so so this is something unspeakable. So I don't know whether you know after what you showed us, 
um, I, 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 I'm overwhelmed with that kind of feeling of unspeakability. But anyway, since, but since you're doing plenty of speaking. <laughs> yes. Okay, so keep going. I like what you're saying. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, uh, one of the uh, key expressions that you have used uh, throughout your, your paper is uh, love of God. I think, I think you have, uh, you know, um, analyzed this in rather great details. Uh, I don't have any questions, but it just, I, I just, you know, two points came to my mind when I was uh, reading your paper. Uh, this is this this idea of love of God uh, that uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy uh, emphasizes on, and of course Prabhupada is is one of the most authentic uh, advocate of this idea in our time. Uh, this uh, non-intellectualist approach to God. And I, what I mean by non-intellectualist is, I mean, philosophers down the ages, both in Western tradition and in Indian tradition, have talked about our uh, knowledge of God, <laughs> and they have explained the epistemology of uh, God, uh, the metaphysical status of God, etc., etc. But uh, I think the uniqueness of this non-intellectualist approach to God, which is, you know, actually, uh, 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 expressed in this idea of love of God uh, is, I think, one of the interesting consequences of this that it has got, uh, uh, this idea has got some very interesting moral uh, uh, consequences. I think you rightly say that uh, uh, Prabhupada at one point said that it's not a religious movement, right? Uh, right. So, so, so purifying the heart. I think, I, right. I mean, this is the expression that you have used. Mm -hmm. And this is very, very important uh, uh, point that one should take note of. I mean, Krishna consciousness is not a typical religious movement like other, other movements that have taken place uh, either in India or in the uh, West. So this, this, this non-intellectualist approach to God has, uh, has some very, very profound uh, uh, moral uh, 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 teachings for the entire humanity. This is something I think we should we should take note of, and perhaps perhaps uh, uh, this could uh, go a long way in 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 uh, you know lessening uh, the 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 uh, the conflict uh, between uh, different religious groups, etc. Uh, etc. Et yeah. With which we are really struggling these yeah. days. So this is one uh, one and and you know. And this, uh, this idea of, of having some important moral consequences is also, I think, could be uh, embedded in the very word Krishna. Mm -hmm. you know, the grammarians uh, you know, um, uh, analyze this word Krishna into two parts, kri and na. Krishibur bhachaka shabda, nascha nirbriti bhachaka. So kri stands for bhu, the word, and na stands for nibriti. So you, by uh, you know, by inculcating the Krishna consciousness, you could free yourself from the limits of this empirical world. And one of the most significant ways that one could transcend oneself from the limits of this world by uh, by inculcating more <coughs> values, and that's that's something I think a very important consequence of, of uh, the idea of love of God that you were uh, talking about in your paper. And uh, another interesting point, uh, I think you have already, uh, you know, uh, alluded to. I think, uh, you know, uh, the binary between man and God collapses. And Chaitanya, I think, is the one of the finest examples of that. Is he God? Well, of course, he has all the divine. Uh, intense, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, attributes manifested in his life. Is he a man? Yes, he is a man like like me in a sense. You know, he is born in a place. He is born of uh, his parents. You know, he was a naughty boy. We were, we were told, etc., etc. So I think this this binary collapses, and this is I think one of the important consequences of this idea of love of God that you were you know, talking about and, and very, very justifiably uh, 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 our uh, Prabhupada Swami also uh, emphasized that. So these are the just mm. few comments nice. that I, I thought I should share with you all. Nice. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, thank you for those comments, uh, very inspiring comments. Uh, first of all, they inspire me to bring out more the idea, which I, I barely got into here, but when the first principle, love is God, is a reversal of the, the Johannine expression, God is love. And even though for this tradition, God is love, but I don't think they say that love is God. The way that I think Vaishnava philosophy, propounded by Prabhupada, can. Because you have Radha and Krishna. But ultimately, what the bhaktas that Prabhupada trained are doing is they are worshipping Krishna, of course. Radha, yes, of course. But not just Radha and Krishna. They are worshipping the love between them which conquers them both. They're worshiping a divine relation. So the binary, as you mentioned, is dissolved, but you can't dissolve the binary unless you have one. I'm saving, uh, making a truism here. But, so you have to have the, uh, the lover and the beloved, but it's the energy between them that conquers them. And that is called yoga maya. Yoga maya upashritaha. Krishna takes full shelter of this loving energy, the yoga maya, the power of union. So that's what this tradition offers. And it's funny when Prabhupada says, oh, we are not sectarian. And, uh, and it's so it's, it's humorous to me, because when you look at devotees, let me look at some of them here, okay? They look as sectarian as you get, okay? They're dressed differently, uh, they're, they're chanting on the streets. I mean, it, does it get more sectarian than that? But what Prabhupada is saying, is that it is love of the, that, that from the heart that needs to be cultivated, no matter what tradition you're, you're from. And Prabhupada did that. Prabhupada did not try to convert people. If you are a Muslim, then be deeply a Muslim. Go to the heart of the tradition, literally and figuratively. He, he was more concerned about establishing the loving heart than establishing this or that tradition. I would claim. And that is how he's not sectarian. And, and the irony, of course, looking very sectarian while not being sectarian at all. So there's another binary that's collapsed. So, um, and I'll just uh, finish by saying that um, in interviewing some uh, devotees once, one very seasoned, advanced uh, uh, Vaishnavi told me that Prabhupada didn't talk much about love. He just talked about surrendering and you know, giving up one's uh, you know, sinful activities. And, this. and I said, really? I said, Prabhupada did not talk much about love. I seem to recall the word love throughout all of his books. I mean, I could be wrong, but anyway, that motivated me years ago to really look into this. And not only is it, is it so ubiquitous, but it's so important to Prabhupada, even to the point of inspiring other people in other traditions to also um, purify the heart and exercise the heart in a religious way according to their preference. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so I think we're ready to go. Uh, so the last paper in uh, session two is then by Ravi Gupta. <laughs> And he will speak on tradition and innovation in Swami Bhaktivedanta's Bhagavata commentary. And we are a little behind schedule, but uh, you'll just have to bear with us. So, Ravi, the floor is yours. I'll make sure you get the timer allocated. Thank you. <laughs> you can hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, so uh, my sincere gratitude to the organizers here, profess, uh, particularly Professor Sardella, uh, for organizing and inviting me uh, to Stockholm University, as well as to Professor Olsen for chairing both my morning session and now the afternoon session. Um, and my gratitude to all of you for being here uh, today and giving me this opportunity to say a few words about this topic, tradition and innovation in Swami Prabhupada's Bhagavata commentary. Uh, so I want to start by <clears throat> mentioning um, uh, Professor David Tracy, University of Chicago, Professor Emeritus now. 
Uh, in one of his books, he has a really interesting definition of um, what constitutes a classic. Uh, when we think of classic works, of literature or philosophy, uh, what do we mean by that? And he provides something of a, um, a, classic, uh, a, a, a description of the various characteristics. First, he says, they shape an entire culture. So <laughs> classics tend not to be period pieces that uh, affect a particular corner or a section of a society, but they see their, we see their lasting effect over large periods of time and large swaths of history. Second, he says that they are universal in effect. Anyone who studies them is affected in some way. Now, not the same way necessarily, but in some way significantly. Um, third, he says that they withstand the test of time. So classics don't come and go uh, very easily. They resist being made irrelevant. Uh, this one I like the best. He says, classics are those texts that contain an excess of meaning. There is no way to contain the meaning within a confined space. Uh, whatever understanding you offer, there's always more to read, more to study. And this is why classic works often see commentaries uh, that number in the dozens and span um, many centuries sometimes. Uh, Paul Griffiths, in a book called Religious Reading, uh, makes a similar point, very well stated, where he says he uh, talks about a classic religious text, a sacred text, as being one that is um, a well that never stops giving, a mine that never empties uh, of gold. Uh, so it contains an excess of meaning, and despite every generation's attempt to provide the definitive meaning, there's always more to be said. Um, he says it serves as a test case for any theory of interpretation. Uh, this gets a little bit technical, we don't have time for, to discuss it fully now, but if one were to have a theory of interpretation, a hermeneutical theory, and if it were to fail on classic text in general, then we need to question the uh, theory rather than the text itself. Uh, and finally, uh, he says, to sum it all up, that classic works command our attention. Um, they're impossible to ignore. We can like them, we can dislike them, uh, but we have to pay attention. Otherwise, we're asleep. So, um, this is how he describes classics in general. In this context, I'm talking about the Bhagavata Purana. And if there's one paradigmatic case of a classic work. I think the Bhagavatam, or the Srimad Bhagavatam, would be a wonderful example. Each of the characteristics I mentioned earlier um, are, are beautifully exemplified in the Bhagavatam. There's three texts that have in some way shaped modern Hindu uh, culture and classical Hindu civilization. Uh, they tend to be listed as the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, and the Bhagavata Purana, in terms of their shaping influence. They have withstood the test of time. The Bhagavata's own journey over thousands of years demonstrates not just its engagement in the world of philosophy, but also poetry, and particularly in the realm of performance. Whether it be dance, music, drama, architecture, every one of these areas has been indelibly changed and affected uh, in India and in other parts of Asia as a result of the Bhagavata's long history. We can go uh, through Southeast Asia as well, and now into the Western world. Um, sorry, I went the wrong way. Uh, yeah, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, contain, um, containing an excess of meaning. The Bhagavata Purana is part of a genre of text called the Puranas, and the Puranas, by their uh, very nature, tend to be uh, rather long uh, in size, 
They tend to be very um, fluid in their movement uh, and very simple in their Sanskrit usage. The Bhagavata Purana has none of these characteristics. It is, um, uh, the, the, the Sanskrit is among the most difficult sacred texts that you find in the Sanskrit language. Any one of us who have struggled through that know this very well. And amongst scholars in India, traditionally the Bhagavata Purana is considered to be a test of one Sanskrit learning. Uh, but also it bears a very long history of commentarial attention. Most Puranas get one, two, maybe three commentaries. The Bhagavata has dozens of commentaries, many of which are no longer extant, but we know of them because they're cited in other commentaries. Um, across from the 13th century, uh, actually earlier to that, um, but systematically starting the 13th century all the way to the present um, day. And so there's an excess of meaning. Uh, no matter how much a commentator writes, there's always someone who's got more to say about the text. Now, um, given the Bhagavatas, the Bhagavata Puranas particular, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention before I forget, uh, the Bhagavata is <clears throat> unique, particularly among the Puranas, in its combination of both literary and philosophical content. Let me explain. Uh, philosophical works, uh, philosophical sections, we heard uh, earlier this uh, morning from Professor Jakobsen about uh, the Bhagavata's treatment of Sankhya, uh, which provides a very good example of a particular type of Sankhya approach. Um, it's exemplary in that regard. That Sankhya is highly technical, it's systematic, and the Bhagavata, when it wants to be systematic and technical, is. Most philosophical works in Sanskrit sacred literature tend not to be exemplars of uh, poetry and literary quality. And works of poetry and literary quality tend not to be exemplars of philosophy. This is just a reality. Um, it's true even today. Philosophical works are difficult to read and uh, get through. Poetry tends not to be very systematic in its philosophical approach. The Bhagavata does something amazing, which is to bring these two things together in um, an amazing combination that includes philosophical reasoning, but at the same time uh, has a literary quality, particularly in the tenth book, particularly in the section that Professor Schweig was discussing on the Rasalila, but not exclusively, uh, where it develops a certain Sanskrit quality that is better compared to the genre of literature known as Kavya in Sanskrit. And um, here, the Bhagavata uses something like 35 different meters, uh, metrical patterns, chandas, in Sanskrit. For context, most Puranas use two, three, four, maybe five such metrical patterns. Um, there are meters in um, the Bhagavata that uh, are not found elsewhere in the Puranas at all. Now, if we think of the Bhagavata as a classic text, um, and it, I, I want to look at just briefly the commentaries on the Bhagavata and what they do before segueing into Swami Bhaktivedanta's commentaries. John Henderson, uh, who's a scholar of Chinese uh, classics and looks at Chinese commentaries, identifies a few characteristics of commentaries that I think are salient for our purposes as well. This is not exactly his list, but it's based off of that. The first thing I want to mention is that commentaries attempt to create theological coherence over a text. So they try to take disparate elements of the text itself. Um, you know, the, the Bhagavata says this here, it says this here, and the two seem to the untrained observer to be um, contradic contradictory. The commentary will create a theological framework around it that resolves those differences and creates a unified voice for the text, overlays it with a theological coherence that usually is promoting the particular perspective of that commentator. 
their theological system. Secondly, uh, commentaries uh, attempt to find a place for everything. They are comprehensive in their approach. <clears throat> so they look for coherence in the text, but they also look for comprehensiveness. Um, what this means is that for the commentator, there is no section of the text which is useless, meaningless, out of place, or irrelevant. The Bhagavata has chapters of genealogies. This son, this, this king gave birth to this son who gave birth to this person who was then the son of this person, etc., etc. Even in those sections, commentators find meaning. It's not merely a record. Thirdly, uh, they're attempting to create consistency of tradition. That means not only are they providing their own theological coherence to the text, but they're trying to connect the text with generations of commentarial tradition that have come before them in an attempt to create coherency not just horizontally, but vertically through history. And finally, uh, perhaps the most important for my purposes here, is that every commentator is speaking not just about the text, but to their audience. This means that every commentator is deeply aware of the issues and challenges and concerns of their generation and their time. And this, therefore, requires the writing of a new commentary. If that, the writing of a new commentary is not merely for the search of meaning within the world of the text, but an attempt to relate the text to the broader world around it. And because the broader world is a world of change, therefore that concern needs to be addressed repeatedly, generation after generation after generation. This is apparent in the commentaries uh, of the Sanskrit uh, uh, texts, and particularly the Bhagavad. So now, let's have a look at what um, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada's Bhagavata commentary does, which is this is all kind of leading up. Here's what a classic is. Here's what the Bhagavata is. Here's what Bhagavata commentaries do. With that background, now let's have a look at what Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada's commentary on the Bhagavata Purana, the Srimad Bhagavata does. This was his life's work. It was his magnum opus. There's no text, no work that he spent more time on more energy, more dedication that he spoke about more frequently as his life's mission, as completing his commentary on the Srimad Bhagavatam, which he got through partway through the 10th uh, um, canto, 10th stanza of the Bhagavatam. There's four things I want to highlight that he does in his commentary. The first is that he makes the text accessible. I mentioned a little while ago that the Bhagavata's vocabulary, its language is incredibly difficult. Not only is it complicated Sanskrit, um, it employs two different forms of Sanskrit, both classical and Vedic Sanskrit. These two make it twice as difficult for the average translator to understand what's going on. By putting the Bhagavata into accessible English, um, an English that was uh, well, not just English, but also um, uh, had a, a poetic or literary quality to it. Prabhupada takes a text that is otherwise very difficult and very dense, with centuries of commentary, and makes it available in um, a language that the average person can understand. And then it prompts its translation in uh, languages around the world. In his commentaries on the Bhagavata, uh, in his Bhaktivedanta purports, as he called them, <coughs> Prabhupada in very intentionally draws upon, summarizes, engages with the commentaries of prior traditions, uh, prior uh, teachers. This is sometimes he quotes them, but usually not. Rather, he engages in the way that traditional 
uh, commentators have done so for centuries, which is simply to take the material from early commentators, amalgamate it into his own thoughts, and provide it in both his translation and his purports. From my study, uh, it seems uh, clear to me that um, he is, his translations are largely a rendering of Sridhar Swami's commentary on the Bhagavata Purana. For those who know something about Bhagavatam, this will make sense. For others, um, well, in questions we can elaborate further on Sridhar Swami. But he's prime, the, the most important commentator on this text from the 14th century. And uh, Prabhupada takes his reading as the standard meaning, incorpor incorporates it into his translation. This means that occasionally scholars will read his translations and go, wait a minute, this doesn't match with the Sanskrit. And that's largely because his translation is uh, not only a translation, but a rendering of Sridhar's commentary, which has traditionally been regarded by uh, most other commentators as the plain sense of the Bhagavatam. Uh, in his uh, purports, then, he'll amalgamate, draw upon the, commentary, the commentaries of other Vaishnav uh, Acharyas, uh, such as Vishwanath Chakravarti and Jiva Goswami. Um, thirdly, <clears throat> he then takes what they talk about in those commentaries and then does uh, what a commentator should, which is he makes that material relevant to his audience. And um, by this, I mean that Prabhupada takes a, um, a, uh, um, any particular theological idea and puts it in conversation with the dominant discourses that he was concerned with in his own time. I'll give you one simple example. There's one particular verse where Jiva Goswami provides a very interesting commentary uh, talking about the difference between the body and the self, uh, and then the difference between the self and the super-self, or the paramatma. In that, in the process, Jiva gives the example of, the, of an axe and an axe wielder. Uh, this body is like the axe, and we are like the woodcutter. Prabhupada takes that metaphor, and since largely no one has seen an axe, a woodcutter cut a tree with an axe, he transforms that into his uh, famous metaphor of the car and the driver. Right? That's a simple example of an update, right? making it relevant. But he does much more than that. Places where uh, the commentators will argue against the Mimamsakas or other um, Indian schools, Prabhupada will change that argument, modify it, on, against um, scientific physicalists, or materialists, or um, secular humanists, right? So he'll take what those, those sorts of arguments, rework them, and address a new opponent, uh, philosophically. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say in 30 seconds, which is, um, finally, what he does is also provide unique theological insights uh, to uh, within his commentaries. And here, um, I'll give one very, very short example, uh, where um, not only is he drawing from tradition, making it relevant and making it accessible, but he's offering his own insights uh, in, that are unique to him. In the third canto of uh, the Bhagavata Purana, there's a beautiful description of Vaikuntha, the divine abode of Vishnu. And there, there's a description of all the different flowers uh, and flowering trees that are present. At the end, the verse says, all of these flowers are worshipped, they're revered by Tulasi. Uh, sorry, all of these flowers revere or worship Tulasi because she is most dear to Vishnu. In his purport to this, which is only three sentences long, Prabhupada makes a point. He says, this demonstrates that in the spiritual world, in Vaikuntha, there is no envy. Because all of these flowers have blooms that are far more beautiful than Tulsi's, who has very small blooms, Manjri's, and yet they are happy to worship her because she is dear to the Lord. So also in the community of Vaishnavas, there should be no envy one between the other. 
And I have looked through all the commentaries I could find, and this doesn't seem to be a point made by anyone else. It was Prabhupada's unique insight on that verse. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I know I was two minutes over. Thank you. So, I will now turn to the to come up and uh, you have five minutes again to comment, ask questions. Well, thanks, thanks. Uh, uh, you know, just two or three uh, uh, points came to my mind while listening to your uh, uh, presentation right now. You know, you, uh, you uh, uh, talked about certain features of what constitutes a classic, okay? Uh, I, I, I'm reminded of uh, a comment made by Rabindranath Tagore while he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, the two epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata. He uh, defines classic as something, I mean, the, the word that he used is the Bengali one, Yugotirna, which transcends the limits of time. So this is how uh, Tagore, uh, you know, uh, defines a classic. And I could see that, you know, in many of the features that you mentioned, this, this idea is coming up again and again. And the Purana, Bhagavata is one of the Puranas, right? Now, the, the word Purana, I think, uh, in the, among the Sanskrit scholars, it is mentioned that Pura Api Navam Purana. So, which is, you know, uh, eternal, but at the same time, there is a novelty in that. So this is this is this actually you know, actually you know uh, describes what what you are talking about uh, uh, while uh, explaining the features of the classic. Um, now another point which I have been actually you know thinking since this morning about your uh, morning presentation. I think in in that paper uh, you somewhere you talked about authorial intent. Uh, so so you know any reader or interpreter is trying to. Uh, you know, get at the intent of the author uh, as expressed in his work. Mm -hmm. And there are some of the problems that you have, you know, talked about this morning. Now, um, this actually, you know, uh, uh, is closely related to one of the features of, the, uh, of what constitutes a classic, excess of meaning. This is a wonderful point that I think we should really encash. Okay, uh, uh, you know, um, I mean, Otherwise, how could one explain uh, the uh, arise or the emergence of 10, at least 10, if not more, Vedantic interpretations of the same set of Badarana Sutras? It's very interesting to see how the same uh, Upanishadic statement is being interpreted by somebody around the Advaita tradition and by somebody else following the uh, doing the tradition. So th this actually, you know, uh, uh, you know, epitomizes in a way the excess of meaning that you are uh, referring to. And I don't know whether, you know, uh, whether we could apply another idea, the postmodern idea of deconstructing a text. So in a way, I mean, I don't know, uh, could we say that uh, Prabhupada was deconstructing Bhagavata in the sense that uh, he was trying to uh, you know, analyze, but an analysis not per se, analyzing the text uh, in order to unearth the hidden meanings of the text. And that uh, is something, uh, you know, something that the postmodern uh, uh, hermeneutics would, would refer to as deconstructing the text. So, uh, so uh, you know, uh, another point I'm not sure whether, whether uh, I mean, are you understood you properly? Uh, you said at one point that you know uh, philosophical texts and literary texts, uh, you know, seem to uh, exclude each other, and Bhagavata is one of, one example that uh, that denies uh, that doesn't leave any room for this exclusion. But you know, I don't know. I mean, Upanishad is it a philosophical text, just, or is it also a literary text? I mean. I, 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 for me, it's it's kind of you know mixture of both. So uh, and also interestingly, almost all the hardcore Sanskrit philosophers in Indian tradition start their book with a Mangala Charana, mm -hmm. almost without any exception. 
and the mangala charanas are usually addressed to uh, some god or goddess or some guru etc and the commentator starts commenting on the significance of the mangala charana which sometimes have dual meanings you know so this is very interesting that the philosopher is not just a philosopher he is also a great literary figure uh, in his own right so that's something i um, i thought that i should share with you that just point you know about uh, the nature of the commentary you mm -hmm. uh, uh, mentioned uh, some features of commentary now in the in the sanskrit text uh, there is a strict definition of what a commentator should do what is a commentary sutrartho varnate yatra padai sutranusarini sva padai jo varnante bhashan bhashya vidu 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 so this is what a bhashya is okay so bhashya describes the meaning of the sutra sutrartho varnate yatra padai sutranusali so the the padas of the uh, sutra are also explained okay and swa padani je varnante the bhashyakar also describes the meaning of the padas that he himself is using while explaining the meaning of the uh, uh, sutra so these are some of, some of the thoughts that i should i thought i thought uh, I should share with you okay, thank you thank you Um, so, uh, first of all, <clears throat> thank you so much for those very thoughtful comments. I have five minutes, four, three, two, uh, <laughs> three. Okay. Okay. So, so thank you for those very thoughtful comments. Let me first of all say my apologies for that rather uh, careless generalization about philosophy and literary texts. I was speaking primarily from my own experience as an undergraduate philosophy major in the United States where I studied endless works of philosophy that to me were not very well written but um I could be wrong sorry that was a rather biased statement you're absolutely right that in the classical system of indian sanskrit uh, philosophy one was expected to be both a philosopher and a poet um and and that is very well apparent and yet at the same time the bhagavata's literary quality far exceeds that of most similar texts in its metrical uh, uh, power and its first um uh um, yeah okay so so that was one thing but the, but the point that i wanted to uh, respond to most uh, uh significantly was uh, thinking about the type of work that probab was doing the type of theology uh, you mentioned the word deconstructivist and um To me looking at Prabhupada's legacy as a theologian he, it's clear that he's doing some elements of historical theology he's drawing from the earlier tradition incorporating it and commenting upon it he also seems to be doing philosophical theology this was a major concern for him and dare i say he was doing some constructive theology as well so perhaps a way to agree with you but use different language would be um not so much deconstructive thought but rather constructive theology where he's taking tradition but not just re, um parroting it but rather building upon it and a lot of that building upon theologically was a direct result of his um uh global movement and his engaging with the broader uh world his experience of giving krishna bhakti globally so for example one of the things uh, shwai said in his presentation was um about the love of god being dormant within the heart of this of this so there's a raging debate at the moment amongst godia scholars about whether this idea that the love of god is inherent in the soul is in fact found within godia tradition <coughs> Uh, or is it uh something that is um uh created by prabhupada uh now that's a larger debate that i don't want to get into here but suffice it to say that regardless of where the um consensus lies on that matter it was prabhupada's experience of giving krishna bhakti in the world that for him corroborated the idea that bhakti is dormant in the hearts of everyone that it's already present 
Because from his... Prema, Dormant. That yes. Uh, uh, Prema. Yeah. That, that his, his experience of this, right, um, his experience of this was something that he um, saw as he gave, as he taught Krishna Bhakti to people from many different backgrounds and uh, um, sources. He, he, it's something that was a result of that. So perhaps, yes, a philosophical theologian, a historical theologian, but perhaps also a constructive theologian that, uh, whose contributions, I think, in that area um, have yet to be fully studied. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. What's going to happen now is that we will have four people who have uh, about three to four minutes each to say something. I'm going to ask them a question. And then after that has uh, finished, Graham, we, are, we also will need you oh, here. Uh, yes. Uh, we will have uh, some questions posed by uh, Knut, uh, Mons, the Amalia, okay? And they will have approximately three minutes each uh, to ask a question or make a comment. And uh, Ferdinando, should we collect all comments or questions and then let them respond? Or should we take one each, which will take longer time, I think? <coughs> so, I'll be the dictator and decide. So what's going to happen now is that I suggest that we just begin with you, and then we continue like uh, this. And after you have finished, I will leave the word to the commentators. And uh, so, my question, what was Swami Bhaktivedanta's historical and philosophical contribution to the West? Please. Gabby, do you want to start? Yeah, I'm thinking. Or should we ask Billy to start with me? Take 20 minutes to think, 3 minutes to <laughs> um, Up to you, Gabby. Yeah, give me a little time. I'm I trying to choose. Billy, the first word then. We start from the other side. Um, okay. Uh, well, uh, well I, of course, the obvious thing is that uh, he made uh, many Westerners, uh, devotees of Krishna, which uh, I mean, was a fantastic uh, accomplishment. Another aspect uh, of it is that um, what happened within the academic uh, field, uh, there was not so much research or knowledge about Vaishnav philosophy or Vaishnav or theistic Hindu traditions at all before Prabhupada came. But now it's developed and um, become very dynamic. But I think personally that uh, his role is, will be much more shown in the future. Because I think that we are living in a, at a time where we have very much been dominated by, by a paradigm based on materialistic philosophy and viewing the world as primarily physical and everything is developed out of that and also about quantifying everything but now for example with artificial intelligence we think if, that if we assemble as much uh, quantity as possible then we can maybe develop conscious machines which is a completely ridiculous idea I think but that's uh, on the agenda and uh, so and it's also shown in you know, how we objectify the world, because what, what science is doing is quantifying everything and, uh, and making everything into quantities and try to develop qualities as quantities, which is, of course, impossible. And uh, you cannot develop conscious emotions and love and all these things. Uh, you cannot explain it materially. But I think that we are soon to view a paradigm shift here because within science itself in quantum physics we know that there is no objective world out there that is not observed everything that exists exists in the consciousness and that is becoming more and more obvious even from the point of science so when this paradigm comes then 
there will be more, not only within the academic field or some religious people we practice in, I think also the philosophy will be able to come up on a much broader open political agenda and uh, yeah, in the public realm. That would be fantastic if it become more culturally uh, known phenomena that can be discussed what it means to be a human being and what is the actual goal in human life, which is uh, not on the very much happy again agenda so far. And then, and now there are so many books out there of Prabhupada, which I think will be maybe not read so much, but hopefully they will be read in the future. Uh, actually, uh, in the session that we had just before, uh, much has been dealt with about the Prema Dharma and the Bhagavad Dharma and the way in which uh, Prabhupada cultivated and inculcated that as a movement. Uh, what I want to st stress on is uh, the historical aspect of uh, the timing and the need that was felt by Prabhupada in expanding this particular religiosity across the world. Uh, we must understand that uh, after the passing away of Bhakti Siddhanta, uh, there was a long hiatus when there was almost a stagnation of the movement. And this was countered and this was taken to another step altogether by Prabhupada when he went to the US in 1965. I think this is significant because uh, just like as we have in hydraulics, when an area which is stagnating, uh, if you have a flow from the other side, then the entire area rejuvenates and there is a flow which tries to channelize uh, emotions uh, and other forms of religious aspirations within an entire corpus. The reason being that in many of the comments which were made by Prabhupada, he states that it is not as if that he is trying to go to the West and trying to make new converts. It has been stressed by Shweig as well, just a while ago. Uh, the need being that he felt that the West and the, and the way in which the Westerners would take to this religion or to this religiosity of religion would actually bring about a change even within the land where it originated. So this flow of energy, the flow of religiosity from one place to the other, it was not as if that he was trying to convert the West. It was as a, as a humanity, he was trying to bring about a bridge across the world and also rejuvenate the movement in India. He states time and again that his god brothers did not cooperate with him at many a stance while he was in India. And this historical role which was played by Prabhupada is significant to remember because we are almost more than 50, 60 years uh, has passed. And it gives us the opportunity to reassess uh, this relationship and the way forward that can be taken. <clears throat> Prabhupada gave in his writings and even in his conversations, uh, his interviews, <coughs> and, his, and his close to 7,000 letters to disciples. I don't think I've even written a hundred letters in my life. Anyway, 7,000. And these were not just, hi, how are you? These were didactic letters. These were letters of guidance, care, individual attention. Extraordinary. I really feel that Prabhupada came and unloaded an an, an, an ocean of ideas and, uh, uh, and ways of thinking that push us from our normal ways of, of thinking about things. 
He was bold. He said things that to this day uh, bewilder and baffle disciples. Um, things he said that are unacceptable in terms of modern day values and so on in some ways. But the essential teachings, the essential teachings were, as I was saying before, is about the principle of love. Even more, not just love of God, but the purification of the heart. And this, is, I see, is the very kernel of everything that he spoke about. And moves into, from his essential teachings, into what I call the supportive teachings, and then supplementary teachings, each less and less important as you go down. They're all important on one level, but they're, they have a relative importance in terms of the very core of his teachings. I think ultimately Prabhupada gave us so much to work with that it, it requires development. And I think, you know, in, in my view, um, he, uh, just like Ravi Gupta was struggling to characterize Prabhupada in his writing. He's a constructivist, he's a, you know, a philosopher, he's a historian, he's this. And that. Well, when I was completing Tamal Krishna Goswami's book for Oxford University Press, he had not even given a title to his book. And I saw that Goswami used the, the phrase, a living theology. He, was a, he wasn't a systematic theologian. There's nothing systematic about it. But he was a living theologian. And the way he lived it and breathed it gave us so much material to work with and things that even appear contradictory. But those are the things that become the fuel for future thinking and, and building of the tradition. Well, Graham, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, there are students who will have a lecture at six, so I will have to oh. give uh, a quick, uh, almost last word to you. Yes. yes we're done. <laughs> and, I, I, uh, you get okay. like two minutes. Yes, yes. I, I went over time in my presentation. I'll go under time here. I, I certainly agree with what my esteemed panelists have said. With, um, all I can do is add one more thing, which but I personally reflect on what is Swami Prabhupada's contribution historically. I think the thing that stands out the most to me is the way in which he dismantled long-standing historical boundaries in the practice of bhakti. Um, and in dismantling those boundaries, he opened up the opportunity for community, a Vaishnava community that had no borders. Um, and and uh, really extended far beyond what anyone thought was possible. Uh, he, he defines this himself in his commentary on Upadesha Amrita, where he describes the purpose of his movement is to create that sense of community, to facilitate loving exchanges between his uh, uh, disciples. So, um, I'll end with that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. The last word a word will go to the sole organizer, Ferdinand Sardella, who also deserves an applause. Thank you. On behalf of Stockholm University, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to the distinguished speakers, scholars, and professors for their contribution to today's workshop on the historical and philosophical contexts of Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. We appreciate all attendees, scholars, students and guests which have been instrumental in the success of this event. Our conversations today have not only deepened our collective understanding of contemporary Hinduism and Vaishnavism, but they have also laid a promising foundation for future interdisciplinary research and collaborations. It's inspiring to witness such commitment to academic exploration, and we genuinely appreciate the time and effort everyone invested in today's event. Thank you.